In this episode, we're going to talk about Stephen and stones, and a little about Abraham, and a little about Moses. Here we go. All right, so setting the stage here, as you recall last week, we had a number of different conversions that were talked about, several thousands of individuals were converted to the gospel, to the fullness of the gospel. And that is a trend that has continued. And we're talking about really about the first few years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the gospel or the church is expanding very, very quickly. And of course, that is cause for growing pains. And certainly the leaders of the church here, the apostles, end up having some of these problems. And so as you recall in the last week, we had a discussion about the law of consecration. And right off the bat here in the next chapter, starting with chapter 6, Acts 6, we see a concern here already about what's happening with the law of consecration. Right here in verse 1, it says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. These would be Greek-speaking Jews, the Hellenists, as compared to probably those that are in Judea or in the surrounding areas of Judea. Because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So the daily ministration would be temporally taking care of them. So of all things that should be taken care of in the church, you would think it would be the widows, especially in ancient times, when it was very difficult for them to be able to find, say for example, employment, right? And so they're failing at this already. And you can see already how the law of consecration here, I think this is just kind of a notice that it's, we're being put on as the readers here, that the law of consecration is going to go through very difficult times and is not going to last. It's not going to make it. And so they start going through something similar to what Moses went through, where, as you recall, back in the time of Moses, he's trying to judge all of the situations. They're, he's trying to make decisions on every conflict and every problem. And his father-in-law, Jethro, finally comes to him and says, hey, you need to create an organization here, a hierarchical structure, to be able to get all these things down, and captains of 10, and captains of 50, and captains of 100, etc." And so what they go through here is a little bit of something like that, where the apostles decide, look, pick, they say to the, the, the members of the church, pick from among yourselves seven worthy men that can help with this because the way they term it we can't go around serving tables and basically what that means is we can't take care of every little thing we're, we're, there's only 12 of us and so the church starts to grow the priesthood starts to grow and a hierarchical structure will begin to unfold here among the church to try and meet its demands as struggles continually come up. And so the people, the members of the church, choose seven, and one of those seven is a man called Stephen. And once these seven are, are chosen, then the apostles lay their hands on their heads and they ordain them. They call them to their positions here. And verse 7 is kind of interesting. It says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. All right, again, the church is growing very, very quickly. The Jews don't know what to do. There's a major conflict happening here. They're losing people from what they believe is the true religion, the Jews, and from losing their control that they would have over a number of these people. So again, the, the, the conflict here again, we always see the major conflicts here typically are not between just good and bad or, or evil and, and sinners and non-sinners, although that is true. But the main conflict is typically one of doctrine, doctrine and control. And we're told here that a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So a number of the priests, that would be from the tribe of Levi, the sons of Aaron, went over to be and be, were converted and became Christians. This was a common thing, actually. This happened before. Back in the time of Lehi, when 
Jerusalem had, for the most part, changed its doctrine, its theocracy, its, its loss of Christ is what I think happened. A number of the priests reportedly left Jerusalem, and they went to what they termed at that time Arabia. And they ended up, in fact, fighting or willing to fight with the Babylonians against Jerusalem because what they saw was a takeover, right? There was a coup, both a spiritual and theocratic coup that took over at the time of Lehi and a political coup that, that, that took over. And so they left and, or were kicked out and were willing to fight against what had happened in Jerusalem at the time. So here again, we see a lot of the priests converting over to Christianity at this time. And we're told in verse 8 that Stephen was full of faith and he did many miracles and wonders. So he is a very impressive person, someone obviously that has, uh, is filled with the Holy Ghost and is very close to the Lord and is, well, he has a great faith that he relies on. And there is a synagogue, or at least a gathering of people, that are known as the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So a couple of things here. The Libertines, this is probably freed slaves, people that would have been in bondage at some point, and they've been freed. Another thing to look at here is these are not people from Jerusalem, or maybe originally they were, but these are groups from other areas, from the diaspora, Jews that live in other parts, and perhaps this is where they meet at times, or their representatives here in Jerusalem from other places, or they returned from those other places and they gather together here in this synagogue, or at least in this, this assembly, this group, we might say. So they've got disputes with Stephen and what he's saying and with what he's doing. Stephen is obviously not out just helping with the widows. He is preaching the Word of God and performing miracles and making a fuss with a lot of the, the Jews in the area. And it says that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. We might think about Abinadi in this circumstance. Think of Stephen going out and preaching about Jesus as being resurrected, as being divine and the Son of God, and that he is the Messiah that Isaiah spoke of. This is what Abinadi did with King Noah and the priests. It's a very similar type of a situation. And a number of, a number of these people here came together and said, listen, we've, spoke, we've listened to Stephen, and he has spoken blasphemous words, and this is interesting, against Moses, and against God. This is important to understand the way that this is being set up. Luke here is, is giving us a clue as to what the, theoc the theology of the Jews is at this time and what their priorities are. We've spoken many times about this where there is a conflict between Moses and Jesus. This is how it works. This is what is going on. The Jews had removed Christ, not Jesus, they didn't know who Jesus was obviously, but centuries before they had removed a divine redeemer from their theology, from their, their doctrine. They had lost it because obviously they had it before. And in place of that, of course, something, something has to be at the top. You can't just remove something and, and everything just stays the same. Something has to move to the top. And what moved to the top was Moses. And so Moses, obviously, with the giving of the law, the lower law, is what made sense to have come up to the top for them. And so they're pretty upset if somebody's dissing on Moses because to them, Moses is the guy. He's as if he was a Christ-like figure and maybe the only person that you could blaspheme against besides God or Jehovah. And so... These individuals stir up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And they end up setting up false witnesses to accuse him again of speaking blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. So looking at this as a holy place, this is just like King Noah and his 
priests did the same thing. They believed they were a righteous people and against the law. Remember, Abinadi goes through and he talks about the whole law of Moses and the Ten Commandments and how they really didn't believe in it. They didn't even follow it themselves. That they don't even get the rest of it, which is the higher law, but even the lower law, because there's no higher law around, is corrupted and it's wrong and they, and they don't follow it. That's what Stephen is saying here. It's the exact same thing that Abinadi was doing with King Noah. And these individuals make the accusation against Stephen in verse 14, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. So that's true. <laughs> Both of those things are true. But when you are so religiously fanatic and ideologically possessed, you cannot keep an open mind if you have been given information, especially when it's religious, it goes down into your core and you have certain beliefs. When people go against that, you start to believe that any means are justified for an end that supports your doctrine and your beliefs. This happens in politics all the time, by the way. If you are so ideologically possessed on the left or on the right, then you start to believe any means are necessary. You lose civility. You then can go beyond that. You could get physical. And you do things because you've, you've allowed it to become such a core part of you, this ideology. This is the same type of thing. It's how and where do we put our beliefs in our belief systems. And last, down here in verse 15, we get another parallel to Abinadi. It says, And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So just like Abinadi, his face is basically shining, right? Same thing happened with Moses as he came down from Sinai. And so then the high priests in charge here in this council, they come back and they say, Hey, Stephen, is this true? Are you blaspheming against Moses? and against God, and against our land, and against the law of Moses here. And this is what Stephen does, which is pretty interesting. He's going to go into a little bit of a biography of Abraham, and then a biography of Moses. Now, why these two? Well, think about what they've been talking about here, that he's been blaspheming against Moses. He wants to explain himself. So he's going to back up to the two greatest prophets that they've had. And he's going to explain a couple of things. And he's going to show how the higher law and Christ are what Abraham and Moses were following. And that what he has converted to, Stephen here, into, into what would later be called Christianity, this sect of Jews, was simply trying to live by the restored gospel and identifying Jesus as Jehovah and as the Messiah. So he starts off by saying, The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. I'm not sure if that's true in Mesopotamia, by the way, but that's a side note. Before he dwelt in, it says here, Karan, which is it, basically it's Haran, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. So this is the leka leka, right? You've got to be on the road. Get out from thy kindred, and from thy people, from thy country. Which is something that all of us have to do. We all have to leave where we're at. And this is kind of what Stephen and the apostles and the new Christians are doing. Exactly what Abraham did. They had to leave a place because of idolatry. They had to, in other words, where the values weren't set properly. Where Christ had been removed and something else was put up in its place. Many other things eventually were put up in its place, in the place of the true idea of a suffering servant, of a suffering God of the atonement. So leka leka, which is move on or leave or walk away, is something that the, the original Christians had to do. And all people with the truth, especially brand new, a, a burgoyning following of, of the truth is going to require this, the leka leka. So a parallel is set here by Stephen from about Abraham 
and about the new Christians. That, I think, is what he's trying to get across here to start off with. And so Stephen proceeds to go through kind of this biography of Abraham where he leaves Haran, he goes into the, toward the promised land, he then has to sojourn down into Egypt. And he speaks of Abraham being given the covenant of circumcision, which Joseph Smith ties with baptism. And then he begets Isaac, and Isaac begets Jacob, and Jacob has the 12 patriarchs, or the 12 heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they go all into Egypt during a time of famine and find Joseph, who's been sold there by his brothers, who is in charge and who is second only to the Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. And they live there in peace until a new Pharaoh comes along that does not know Joseph and his people. And then they're put into bondage. And then eventually comes Moses. And this is what it says about Moses, which is kind of interesting, what, what Stephen says. He says in verse 20 here, In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. I don't think that Stephen really cares to talk to the council here about how Moses' looks were, about how you know he was a really good-looking dude. That's not what they're saying here. Think about what is said about Mary, um, especially in the Book of Mormon, where Nephi has his vision of Mary, the Virgin Mary, and then of Jesus Christ being born to her. We're told that she was exceedingly fair and white. This has nothing to do with her appearance. To be honest with you, her skin color may have been darker than any Europeans. It has nothing to do with her skin. It has nothing to do with race. It has to do with the spirit. It has to do with the way that they used to talk about those that may have had the spirit with them or that were noble and virtuous and living uprightly. That's what they're saying about Moses here. And then we get the biography, the biography of Moses, where he lives 40 years there and, and knows the ways of Egypt, which definitely helped him when he took the Israelites out of Egypt and helped him with the temple, honestly, helped him with administration, helped him with leadership, etc. And then he comes out after 40 years and he kills the man that is beating one of the Jews, one of the slaves, and both the Jews reject him and the Egyptians want him. And so he flees out of Egypt. I believe he knew exactly where he was going, and he went to Midian, where he found Jethro, who became his father-in-law. And Moses ends up marrying his daughter, Zipporah. But you get this in this story right here with, with the slave that is being beaten and with Moses killing the Egyptian. You get already here a an allusion to Moses as being the one who is going to free them from their captors and yet be rejected for quite some time by the Israelites anyway. That's kind of what happens there with that story. He is freeing them from his, their, their oppressors and the Jews aren't happy about it. And that theme carries on throughout the entire Exodus. And in verse 30, we get a little nugget here that's important. It says, And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. If you read Deuteronomy, you're going to get the idea that not only did the people, were they not allowed to see him, that was by choice, by the way, but that Moses could not see God. He couldn't actually see him. And there was just the burning bush. We get something different right here where it says that the angel of the Lord, which is the Lord, was there in a flame of fire in a bush. You can also think about the symbolism of the tree of life here. But that's an important thing to understand. This is different from what the Jews would have believed at this time. They would not believe that there was actually a personage that would represent Jehovah. They did not believe that Moses or anybody else could have seen God, that that was... That was not allowed, but it was not allowed because they had rejected the higher law previously where they would be able to see God. It's a representation of actually going through the veil and having the higher law and the higher priesthood, but that was rejected by the Israelites at Sinai. So they couldn't see God. So they have to excuse it and say it's not permitted at all. And so then Stephen makes the point here of saying, 
that this Moses, whom the Israelites refused, whom it said, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. This is a theme that Stephen's about to go through, that the prophets that are sent to Israel are rejected continually. And he says right here, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, this is verse 37, which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up, look at the brazen serpent, unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. So this is a very strong uh, uh, anchor point for the early Christians, that Moses, who the Jews revere the most above all people, prophesied about Jesus Christ. So they bring that connection all the time, including the brazen serpent, the reference to the brazen serpent with Moses. And he gives the example then of how the Israelites rejected Moses. And he's talking directly to them. He's basically saying to the council here, you are rejecting God. Just as Abraham had to get out of Dodge, Leka Leka, right, from his kin and from everybody else, because they were idol worshiping. In other words, when we say idol worshiping, what the representation of that is, even though it's true, the representation of that is, is that they have removed Christ. They have moved the Son of God from their theology. And they're worshiping other gods and other things. In other words, they have put other things up in their values hierarchy higher than a loving, suffering God that connects the, with each of them individually and gives them an eternal potential and progression. So they've put that aside and they've, put, they've elevated other things higher than that, including idols. And so he brings up the fact that they made a golden calf and that they turned their hearts back to go to Egypt and they were rejecting Moses. Well, what is Moses doing here? Well, it's exactly what he said. Number one, the rejection is of the higher law. They rejected the higher law. And part of that higher law is Christ. And that's exactly what Stephen is saying right here. That Christ is the one, Jesus Christ is the one that Moses spoke of. And that's part of the rejection. And he's saying to the council here, this is you too. This is still the way it is. And he says here specifically in verse 40, Stephen says as an example of Moses, he says, that the people were saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become, become of him. In other words, while well, he was up for 40 days with his vision and, and communing with Jehovah. And in 42, he says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Basically what he's saying there, when they talk about the host of heaven, this is not the Lord of hosts. This is the host of heaven would be the astral gods, we would say, right? Like we think of with the Romans, with Mars and Jupiter, etc. This is what became common among all people. And then in verse 44, something is brought up here that I think is an important point that confirms what we've spoken of previously with Moses. Stephen talks about the temple. And of course, the temple goes right in with Moses, right? Because this is what happened on Sinai. And Moses comes back down and eventually they build the tabernacle, which is the first model of what they were going to build of a temple. And then eventually, hundreds of years later, finally the temple of Solomon is built, which is built after the model of the, of the tabernacle. But it says here in verse 44, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. That's the, the, the tabernacle, the large tent. As he had appointed speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. This is a very important point to understand. The second interpreter right, that I have that we go through is temple imagery and drama. This is important to understand what happened on Sinai. What happened on Sinai was a vision. And we go to the beginning of Genesis. What we have there in the creation story is simply temple liturgy. This is not a history of the world. We think that that's kind of what's happening 
because we open up the Bible and it starts off and says, in the beginning. But actually what in the beginning means is in the pre-existence. But not just in the pre-existence, but it means in the Holy of Holies. That's what they're talking about. The Holy of Holies is that representation of where God is. And so what we get through the creation story and then with the, the story of Adam and Eve is we get a vision of the temple of not just of how principles that, that are there about creation and about organization and about hierarchy and priesthood, but the temple is built after this vision. Day one is the Holy of Holies. Day two is the veil, etc., etc., etc. We'll go over that another time. But when we look at Genesis, it's a much easier to understand those stories in there doesn't mean some of what that is some of that shouldn't be some of that shouldn't be taken liter- literally but it's not science it is not a history it's not even a chronology it is simply a vision a spiritual symbolic vision that was given to Moses remember before that with Abraham the other example here that Stephen is going over Abraham has a creation story also in the book of Abraham why because if you read the book of Abraham, you realize that he is having a vision. He sees the same vision that Moses does. And, and he sees this vision because he's going to need to create the temple also and the ordinances that are within that. Abraham was at the head of a dispensation. He had to have that information. And it also explains the crazy verbiage and cosmology that Abraham gives with Kolob and Oblish, or I can't remember exactly what the name of the second planet is. But all of these crazy things that we read about in there, this is not some model of the universe. I've seen a number of different takes on this. It's, I guess that Abraham had a, uh, an Earth-centered cosmology, and this is just based on what his understanding is. Well, well that part might be true, but it has nothing to do with explaining what the universe is, not in physical terms. It is a vision that he is having. He is being explained something about priesthood, about hierarchy, about the spirit, and about the temple. That's what that is, and that's how we need to look at those things. It takes away the conflict of science and evolution and geology and creationism that we get in the Bible. Understand that even though the principles are there of creation, that this is about the temple. And what, as we're told here by Stephen, the temple, the tabernacle and the temple are built after as a model of what Abraham, of what Moses and other prophets saw in this vision that they had. So an important point and something that goes directly to that point number two or that interpreter number two that we follow here of the four interpreters. And then Stephen seems to go on here, but he quotes the prophets and says, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. You resist the higher law. You're stiff-necked and you're hard-hearted. As your fathers did, so do ye. And he's also talking directly to the council. You are stiff-necked, you are hard-hearted, and you resist the Holy Ghost. You resist the higher law. And in verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, that would be Christ, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. So what is Stephen laying out here? He's going back and he's showing the history of Here you've got Abraham and Moses that you look up to, but these were followers of Christ and they prophesied about Jesus Christ, about Jehovah coming down and taking on the sins of the world. And you rejected him just like your fathers have always rejected the prophets. And this is an important theme in the Old Testament. What happens to the prophets? They're constantly killed. Many of them are stoned. It's said that Isaiah was cut asunder. He was cut in half by King Manasseh. Lehi was about to be killed for the very same reason. 
for the same reason that Stephen is bringing up here, not because he's preaching just against them being wicked. It's because he's talking about the Messiah, about the Son of God. That's why they're going to kill Lehi. And what is the reasoning behind what they're talking about and accusing Stephen here? It's the same thing they were accusing Lehi of. It is blasphemy. That's what Laman and Lemuel were accusing their father of, a visionary man. Blasphemy. So it's happening all over again. And he's showing this pattern. And here it is happening exactly now with Stephen. They're accusing him of blasphemy. And just like the prophets of old, they're about to stone him for the exact same reasons, because they are hard-hearted. They will not listen. What puts a people or an individual in a position where, I mean, they're doing this because they're, they think they're, they're right. They're justifying what they're doing, not for gain. Maybe ultimately there's power and other things that are behind this. But out in front of why they're doing this, it's blasphemy. What puts an individual... What puts you, what puts me, what puts a group, a society, a people in a position where they are lockstep in an ideology, believing that they're moral and that they're right and that they can justify the means of actually killing someone or being violent against someone so that they can protect their beliefs and their doctrine and do it in the name of God. That's what's happening here. And we can have that, again, I, I, we can have this, especially in religion, this can happen. A lot of what we get in the scriptures is not just with the good against the evil, but it's, it's the evil within, right? It is the evil within and how easy it is to lose goodness. It's what happens over and over in the Book of Mormon. Right? It's, in, it's the inward struggle. The Lamanites, they always take care of. But inward, it's the breaking up of the people. It's the, it's the chaos that eventually comes into the groups of people, and they all become ites. Right? They become different sects, different peoples. This is the problem that happened with the Catholics and the Protestants, to the point where there was murder and there was death because of a moral superiority that was believed in. And it was done in the name of God. Now, that's not the environment that we currently live in, but I think to a smaller degree, we can all be subject to that kind of an ideology or a, a belief system where we are too rigid in, in our beliefs. We want to be firm. We want to be faithful and steadfast. But part of that, I think, is always having the Holy Ghost because we're not always going to be right. And we're not always 100% positive on maybe our own personal beliefs and, and our doctrine and our behaviors. But if we're tying ourselves to the Holy Ghost, we stand a much better chance of not letting a situation, even in a small degree like this, come up and, and, and take us down a wrong path or, help us, or, or, or cause us to make a wrong decision with someone. But the council here will have nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. And he says here, just like Abinadi in 53, you guys have, have received the law by the disposition of angels and you haven't kept it. So again, they're fighting for the law and for Moses, but they don't even keep it themselves because they can't. You cannot keep a lower law in place without the, looking forward to the higher law, to Christ and the atonement. It can't work. You cannot live in just a physical world. You cannot live in just a task-oriented world. You cannot live in a world just with rules and commandments. It will eat itself alive. And that's what has happened with the Jews at this time. And then, miraculously, you know, when he said these things, it says that they were cut to the heart. I love that phrase, being cut to the heart. I've had that happen to me sometimes. Maybe you have too. It's, it's, it's tough. Right? The truth can be harsh, as Nephi says to his brother sometimes, and that they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, this is verse 55, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So he has this vision there. And again, why is Jesus there? Why does he see Jesus there at this point? 
It's because that's what this is all about. Just like with Abinadi, this is all about Christ. And so here he is coming back and saying, basically, thank you for witnessing for me. Because that's what he's been doing as he goes through this biography of Abraham and this biography of Moses and the history of this council's people. And so then he says, as a witness now, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And then in 59, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. We've heard this somewhere before. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, or we might say he gave up the ghost. So this is very similar verbiage to what went on with Jesus when he was on the cross where he's saying, don't blame them, which is really very interesting. It's a very interesting concept. He is being stoned to death by them. They're out, outraged by him. They want to kill him. They hate him. There is rage in them. And he's saying, forgive them. Don't blame them for this. Why does he say that? Is he just trying to be good? I really think there's a clear understanding to Stephen, as there was to Christ, about how the world works. We don't know what we would do in a point in history, in a certain circumstance, with a certain environment around us, in certain teachings that have been given to us our whole lives. Somehow we are thrown into this melting pot, into this laboratory, at a different point in, in, in geography and in time and in culture, in doctrine, and we're supposed to do as best we can within those circumstances. And sometimes, many times, most of the time, those circumstances are very negative, and the teachings can be very negative. And so he's basically saying they're not guilty because of Adam's sin, so to speak, or they're not guilty because of their fathers and their grandfathers and their great grandfathers' sins, or at least take these things into consideration, Lord, with them. Don't blame them. I think that's some, um, I think it's not only incredibly noble and beautiful and wonderful and strong, but I think it's very tuned in to how the world works. Now, we mentioned Saul. These clothes were laid at the feet of someone called Saul. Saul was one of those from Cilicia that was mentioned at the synagogue. So, just like Alma was at the trial of Abinadi and fleed. Here is, there is a similar type of a trial. Abinadi was burned. Stephen was stoned. But with Saul slash Paul, the same thing didn't happen. He doesn't flee. He is still enraged and possessed ideologically. But shortly we're going to learn a lot more about this man. So Stephen goes down in history as the first martyr we know of, of the early Christians. And I hope we can see this event now a little bit differently as a pivotal point with these early Christians, like, just like we would with an Abinadi, or just like we would as a Joseph Smith or somebody who is preaching in a, a very poignant moment. Stephen is originally called to take care of widows, of those whose husbands are dead, who have passed on. And he ends up very quickly losing his own life for the greatest cause that there is. I'll talk to you next time.